Hi kids, welcome to Meditation 72 of the Dudist and Taoist Te Ching. For this meditation, Brother Neil has brought you to the 1905 boomtown of Las Vegas. This is Las Vegas' first state bank, or at least a reproduction of it. Now allow Uncle Neil to give you a tour. There is the Las Vegas Mercantile, of course, and next to it, the Arizona Club Casino, and the Majestic Theater, which still runs shows today. But now they're for the uh, Springs Preserve information purposes. And next to the Majestic Theater, at the end of the street, is the Las Vegas Salt Lake Depot, train depot, right there. You can rent the house there at the end. That's uh, advertised as uh, available for rent. <laughs> and here we have the men's boarding house. Brother Neil is thinking of uh, applying for a room here. And coming down the street and away from the sun for a moment, I'll back up. There's a nice image of uh, what these homes look, look like. These are all I would imagine replications, but Brother Neil doesn't know for sure. Either way, this is what Las Vegas looked like in 1905. Back when it was just a little baby. And why has Brother Neil brought you here and given you this tour? Because in 1919, why Goddard titled this meditation Room to Breathe and he interpreted it this way when the people are too foolish to recognize danger disaster will surely come do not confine the people in tight quarters or they will chafe against your rule give them room to breathe so they will not become restless the wise while valuing themselves do not overestimate themselves. They reject flattery and gain some merit. At least we hope we gain some merit. Is Brother Neil saying that he considers himself wise? Uh, sort of. <laughs> on some days. Some days not. Depends on how much of this Brother Neil has done. And Dwayne Utsi, titled, uh, interpreted 72 this way. As soon as the people no longer respect authority, a far more insidious force will descend upon society. Therefore, do not encroach on the territory of others and do not reduce their quality of life. It is only when their leaders don't disturb the people that they are not prone to disturbance. That they are not prone to disturbance. It is for this reason that the sages know their strengths, yet don't show them off. Though they have great self-respect, they do not stoke their self-regard by rooting out a sense of superiority. They cultivate a strong relationship with their fellows. And the Duda's version says, As soon as people cease to give a shit about the rules, they enter a world of pain. Therefore, do not step over the line and do not threaten anyone with castration. It is only when rich fucks raid private residences that people are reduced to robbing rugs. Though the dude may have been to college, he does not display credentials on the wall. Though he self applies an honorific handle, he does not regard himself heroically because his casualness runs deep. 
he is always welcomed in the abodes of his acquaintances. Right there. The abodes of my people. <laughs> so what's all that talking about anyway, Neil? I mean, it's a great town and all, but uh, it doesn't exist anymore, and I have no idea what you're saying. Well, let me take a beverage. This is going to be designated a national monument on Tuesday, we believe, when President Joe Biden visits Las Vegas. We'll see. Human beings are social animals, and all social animals have hierarchies. Despite what many modern philosophies would have, would have us believe, a propensity towards hierarchy is not only an inescapable element of our psychology, but pretty much of all natural systems. The problem in most mass societies has always been how to create a system in which the hierarchy remains stable and helps the society as a whole to flourish. In primitive societies, it was a threat of top-down physical force that ensured the stability of the system. Yet as cultures have grown more sophisticated, merit meritocratic, meritocratic avenues for advancement and rehabilitation now allow greater fluidity of movement within the hierarchy. Of course, that doesn't mean that top-down fascism has been eradicated far from it only that the fascists have had to get more creative, mostly by resorting to techniques like fear-mongering against outsiders, pony patri phony patriotism, pony patriotism as well, and complex political and economic trickery, like creating a coup. Frustratingly, we will probably always suffer an arms race between the elites of any hierarchy and its more populous lower rungs, but at least most modern forms of democracy give a fighting chance to the underclass. It's a shame, of course, as many economic models have shown that reinvesting a greater deal of resources in the bottom and middle are likely to create a, more pros a, more, a greater prosperity for everyone, including the top tier. Ruling classes back in 1905 and such rarely showed much consideration or sympathy for the psychology of their plebeian populations. When Lao Tzu penned the surprisingly progressive meditation, that's because at that time most societies believed that power and value flowed from the top down, from heaven to the earth, from gods to men, and from royalty to the riffraff. We now know that this is not true at all. It mostly flows upwards, organically. Taoism's supp supposition that all organizations need to derive their power and momentum from the bottom up, the roots rather than the flower, necessarily obligates the enlightened Taoist ruler to show great consideration and sympathy for their constituents that in mind, this meditation discusses the approach that such a ruler might adopt when leading a populace. It is an orientation that can be extrapolated to the management of or organization of any group or human beings. A family, a business, or a bowling team. The primary objective here seems to be the minimizing of the egotism and greed to which the humans are prone to succumb after acquiring status or influence. Lao Tzu recommends that we actively root out these counterproductive aspects of our psychology so that we can better serve the system and its participants. What's more, it's implied in other chapters of the book that the sage leaders, 
sage leader must train his constituents to do the same. In a hierarchical system, we are nearly all both leaders as well as the lead. If one were to write a book on Dudist economics and Benjamin Oliver, the father of Dudism, as it were, he's the founder, has done that, one would have to first point out the misconceptions inherent in the Big Lebowski's take on voodoo economics, otherwise known as supply-side economics. Lebowski's wealth, the elder Lebowski's wealth and power had always been an entirely top-down phenomenon. He obtained all his money from his wife's family and his daughter Maud's Maud relates that he was a total failure in running the family business. Ironically, while he rails against the bums and freeloaders who would seek a handout from the state, he is the greatest freeloader of all, coasting through life not on his own merit, but that of his in-law. The principle of redistribution of wealth, which arch-conservatives rail against, is not, to ju- is not just to help the needy, but to invest in the entire system by recycling a modest amount of power from on top and using it to fertilize the soil. Greater prosperity and stability can be produced across the board, yet when the power is concentrated on top, it rarely trickles down like pissing on a rug. In seeking recognition of his wall of achievement, rather than creating innovation, Lebowski, the elder, works only to enrich himself at the expense of the world around him. The failure of communism and 1960s idealism afforded the hard right wing such a powerful propaganda wing victory in the 1980s and 90s that it allowed them to betray their own principles. Rather than pulling themselves up from their bootstraps, they enacted policies which made it easier to uh, generate wealth from wealth itself rather than merit. The elder Lebowski then is the ultimate gold bricker of all. Conversely, the dude evinces an economic approach that lounges on the other extreme of the spectrum. The dude is more like a primitive forager who consumes only the bare minimum of resources and creates only the bare minimum of wealth. Though he produces little, he also expects little and takes advantage of no one. He reminds us of what's necessary for contentment. Of course, if we all live like the dude, civilization would quickly collapse. Most folks, however, are where the bell curve expects us to be, in the bulge of the middle class. Traditionally, it has not been such a bad place to be. Studies have shown that the mega-rich aren't any more content than the median. However, economic models promoted by Reaganomics and subsequent acolytes like the elder Lebowski have eroded the might of the middle, redistributing wealth in a very undaoistic and undue direction. Not to the soil, but up on high to the fragrant, but in fertile flowers of the remote upper classes. This process really started to get underway in the late 90s. Brother Neil was there and rebelled against it. Precisely when the Cohen brothers crafted the Big Lebowski. We should hope that they employ it again in order to write a sequel and a solution. While most Lebowski fans shudder at the idea of a follow-up, it might be fun to see the dude's offspring running for office in the post-apocalyptic wasteland brought 
about by their granddad, President Lebowski. <laughs> and that is going to conclude the meditation. But I would like to take you through the train depot and give you that. So please, follow Brother Neil. Hi there. I'm good. How are you doing? Is uh, am I doing something wrong? Well, yeah, we kind of closed at four o'clock. Oh my! Yeah, it's after. I should go then. Yeah. Let Let me just uh, uh, do the uh, uh, finalization here, and I'll be gone. <laughs>